Good morning, everybody. Bright and early. Um, no, I mean, we started we start day two a little bit later for a reason. I know everyone had a good time last night. Thanks for everyone who came to the after party. And thank you all for having me. Um, it's an honor to have been invited to give the morning keynote today. And um, just to introduce myself, my name is Kay Adam White. You can call me Adam. I'm a senior software engineer based here in Boston. Um, worked for a number of years at a company called Boku, which is doing um, open source consulting and building applications and data visualizations and helping companies solve technical problems using free and open software, um, often WordPress. And this talk is kind of about the makeup of people in this room in some regard. So before I get deep into it, I'd like to have you introduce myself, get a sense for who you are. Who in the room is a developer, first and foremost? 30% maybe. How about writer, business owner, um, artist, designer? Awesome. This talk is about the fact that we're all sitting here together on a beautiful Sunday in Boston. It's a little bit of a departure for me. I'm used to talking about code, but for the past year or so, as I've worked on the, some of the recent pieces of WordPress, like the REST API project, I've been thinking a lot about what it is that WordPress is and does more. And every time you log into the Slack instance that we use to coordinate WordPress development, we get greeted with these little messages. If you've used Slack, you know a lot of the default ones for WordPress. They've been customized. They're things like rounding corners for Kubrick mode. <laughs> sort of cute throwaway messages, but this one always catches my eye. Democratizing publishing is the stated goal of Automatic, the company that runs WordPress.com, and it's the closest thing that I've found to a mission statement for WordPress as a whole. And I just find it to be a really interesting way to put what it is that we're trying to do here. It's a good mission. We give people around the world a voice, a place to be heard, a place to make their own online, to share their thoughts, we make our own rooms online using this as well. And that makes sense for publishing. But to democratize software, the title that I've chosen for this talk, to democratize something, our dictionaries tell us that we have to make it not just available, but understandable to all people. And all people is a tall order. I think thinking about what all people really means should make me question the title that I've chosen for this talk, because software is code. Not much is true about everyone in this room, um, other than that we're all currently in Boston. But that's true of WordPress in general. The community is pretty diverse, it's a multivariate. It's got a lot of nuance and it's different types of person in it. But we're all human, so we're all born, we all die, and we all start out not knowing how to code. Code is complex. The word itself means impenetrability. It means something that is not human friendly, something that is deliberately opaque and obscured. And that's, of course, why we use the word code to describe programming. Programs are abstract. Computers work in abstract ways. You're moving small pieces of electricity around with words. It's a kind of strange magic. So we invented symbols and programming languages to make it easier for us to tell computers what to do. That abstraction, however, raises the barrier to entry to some regard. Learning to code is hard. Even in the matrix where literally every character is a hacker, only one or two people per ship have the responsibility of sitting down in front of a computer on a regular basis. And so democratizing software. To do that, you really have to teach programming. If you want to give people common literacy into how it is that computers work, at some point you have to Think about teaching people how to code. And a lot of people at this point turn to the broad idea of open source. WordPress is open source. It means that you can go and you can get the code that makes WordPress run, and you can take it and do with it as you see fit. You can read through it, learn from it. But just having the source code be open is not enough. When we talk about free and open source, free as in freedom, that's a great phrase, but if you don't have the time or the money to take advantage of access to something, you may as well not have access to it. And a lot of people don't have the time, money, existing knowledge, um, access to academic resources to understand how technical systems function. They have other concerns. And a couple years ago, we started to talk about whether everyone should learn to code. I'm not trying to suggest that, but I'm suggesting that everyone 
should have the right and opportunity to understand how computers work when and if they want to, because increasingly they're governing our lives, and I think that we kind of have a responsibility to each other to know what they're doing so that we can keep the systems around us honest. Programs shouldn't be magic. Programming itself is fundamentally a thought process. It's structured problem solving. And that's a really useful skill that you can apply in a number of different ways. And I think that when we say, oh, you can learn to code, just go start writing some code online. There's all this open source stuff. I'm missing the point about how you build those skills. And this was something that the web itself was kind of, at some level, originally supposed to help with. The initial promise of the internet was that it wasn't just a thing we consumed, but it was actually also a thing that we would be implicit in making. We would be helping to build it. So web technology is, is often seen as a good entry to software because it's considered to be easier in certain ways than other types of code. With only a basic knowledge of HTML and software that will let you fling your bytes out into the internet, you can start to build yourself a place online. And this idea of physical location in the digital ether is something that companies like GeoCities actually sort of capitalized on, organizing sites into neighborhoods, giving you addresses. As platforms arose in the 90s and 2000s, like AngelFire, GeoCities, eventually LiveJournal and MySpace, it became easier and easier to start putting your code online, building yourself a little home on the internet, building yourself a web page. But as we started to build more reliable systems for building websites, the sites themselves started to look a little bit more the same. Um, you could customize your MySpace, you could certainly do whatever you wanted with a live journal theme, but you might have a more limited palette of options than if you were just setting out to write something from scratch yourself. The houses began to look a little bit more the same. We began to get into this sort of terrifying suburbia nightmare of web design. To the point where now, all of our websites are cubicles and office buildings. Taking templated sites to their extreme, the present day we've traded the expression and questionable rotating text practices of our youths for ease of use. Almost everybody's web presence requires no coding at all these days, but we're locked into a certain platform and the way that certain providers want things to look and function. A computer scientist I know described the world that Apple and Facebook have built as being paternalistic. They know best, so we shouldn't worry our little heads about it too much. The smartphone itself, I think, notably, is so pared down that to write software for it, you have to use a different machine and someone else is going to be writing the software as the person who's using it. This is where most of our existing systems fail, because sites that prohibit customization limit curiosity, and I think curiosity is pretty fundamental to the web and how we should be making use of it. We can still do things ourselves, even without tools like WordPress or any of the existing libraries and content management systems out there. We can fire up a text editor and find a server somewhere and drop some text files on it and start building. But if you try to ask, how do I make a website in 2017? It is not a straightforward process. Because when you go looking for guides on building websites, you run into all of this. All sorts of different programming languages and frameworks and environments and acronyms and missing vowels everywhere. Do I really need to learn Ruby and Python and PHP and Drupal and Joomla and Django and Vue and React and you name it to build a website? My friends told me I could just learn HTML. All of these tools are aimed at people who already have some base level of familiarity because they're all designed to solve a specific technical problem that you get to at a specific point in growth building things on the web. And they're all very powerful tools, but if you're just confronted with a list, you don't have any real good way to start. And that's, I think, where something like WordPress comes in because WordPress is useful to programmers and it wraps up a lot of these existing frameworks and tools in a useful way, but it's first and foremost for writers, and for people who write and make their websites with it, and for restaurants and newspapers and magazines and artists. This sets it apart from most other major open source communities where the audience and the consumers of the software are also technical. <clears throat> and I believe that that part of WordPress, that both the software and the community have been built around users and are intermeshed in this way is pretty unique in the web ecosystem and pretty special. 
WordPress doesn't want you to make a site that looks like everyone else's. You might end up doing so. There's a lot of sites out there using the default themes, and I know that there's a lot of people who design for WordPress regularly who can almost instantly pick the WordPress sites out of the lineup because there are certain conventions that people follow. But the theming system that WordPress provides means that you can make a site that looks the way you want that isn't necessarily going to look like your partners or your sons or your uncles or your friends. Themes and plugins provide this incredibly flexible starting point for us to non-technically mix and match components to build the things that we want to see on the internet and to get our words out there. We've still got a lot of work to do to make it easier to find and configure the things we want. I think that that new user experience is one of the weakest parts of WordPress. But nobody can argue with the flexibility of choice that we have. And we actually take that choice and then we encourage you to customize it. The work that's gone into the customizer of WordPress is hugely helpful for finding a theme that works for you, and it's the first step in easily personalizing your site. For the developers in the room, I've been arguing that supporting the customizer is one of the most empowering things that we can do for our users, whether we're building a theme or a plugin. And it's in the customizer where, by accident, a WordPress author might encounter something that we might turn code. Last year, the customizer gained this additional CSS tab. We can change how our site looks just by writing some words into a text box. No FTP, no files, just you and your site. And some arcane stuff that you copy from Stack Overflow in all probability. <laughs> and best yet, the changes you make are applied in real time so that you can see that feedback loop. User interface designers like Brett Victor that have been encouraging these feedback cycles will be proud of the work that we're doing here. This is the start of what I describe as the WordPress style of programming education. It's not the only way that people can learn to code, certainly. Um, and it's not the only way that the people that work on WordPress learn how to code. But it is a path that I think is uniquely enabled by this ecosystem that we've created and by the diversity of people that end up in a room like this one. Learning to code with WordPress is practically motivated. It's incremental. And it happens largely by accident, I think, starting here with CSS style sheets. We have a site. We want it to look different. Because WordPress can be customized, we want to customize it. And so someone tells us that we can change the background, and we want to give it a try. And they haven't given us a button because the theme doesn't really support the customizer yet. So someone that we know suggests that we can try the CSS stuff. And maybe they help us. Maybe we read a book. Maybe we Google for something on the internet. But we type some words into a text box and hit apply, and then we've written some code. This is code. It's abstract, but maybe it's making things a little bit less magical. By using CSS, you're using the tools with which WordPress itself is made. That's all it takes. It doesn't require something more fundamental or something that we would consider a more formal programming language. And um, this is actually a point where I get into arguments, because I've met software engineers who would say that CSS is not code. And I think that that is both ridiculous, destructive, and wrong. CSS is a complex and rich language that can be used to do incredible things and make your site look spectacular on the web. And it's very, very complex. In the right hands, it can work wonders. And still, I regularly hear friends almost putting themselves down that they only know CSS, sort of ignoring how spectacular it is that you're arranging pixels with words. And so, in thinking about sort of what I wanted to share in this talk, I kind of wanted to dig into the way that we need to fight these attitudes that these tools are unapproachable and that any one of them is itself lesser than others. Because learning is a gradual process, and tools build upon each other and combine in interesting ways. And you have to start somewhere. CSS can work wonders, but it can't change the underlying content of the web page, the structure, the words that are there for you to style. And that's where many of us at some point found ourselves wanting to move deeper and to rearrange or augment the structures of our sites. Our themes are open source, so we can open them up and start moving things around. Break our page, figure out what we did, fix it. Mostly, we're going to be doing this by moving around HTML, hypertext markup language, the words internally on a web page that are used to structure the content that you see. And while we're editing these theme templates, we might also be seeing these other more esoteric statements embedded between angle brackets and question marks. 
we might eventually, just through familiarity, begin to intuit or study what these pieces of code do and start learning what we call template tags, the specific methods that WordPress makes available for us to render a theme. WordPress is written in the PHP programming language, and PHP stands for Fancy HTML. <laughs> <laughs> or at least that's the way that it's easiest to learn it. It's actually a pretty robust programming language, but when you learn it through WordPress, you do it in this sort of accidental, gradual way. And later on, you can learn about functions and child themes and reflection and all sorts of other methods, but you have to start somewhere. But maybe you don't want to work on the structure of the page that's being displayed to the users when they come to your site. Maybe you want to make it interactive, and that's going to take us down another route um, towards JavaScript, the most widespread programming language in the world, and the only one that runs directly within our web browsers, like Chrome and Firefox. JavaScript is also complex, and we can't quite stumble our way into it the way that we do from HTML to PHP. And so we might turn to an add-on library like jQuery, which was written to normalize a lot of inconsistencies about how JavaScript worked across browsers. When jQuery came about, it was solving a very real need. Over time, the browsers have caught up. But these tools that make it easier and gather a lot of useful methods in one place are still very useful to us when we're learning, because they give us a way to understand a library of possibilities that we can apply to our projects. So things like jQuery still fill a critical role in our community and in our tool chest. It's the well-worn tools in the toolbox that are the ones that you use the most, and if you've used it the most, you might trust it the most, so it's worth keeping around. So as we're making our site more complicated, we might be starting to want to stay or store some other type of data in WordPress. I know people that have used it for everything from Foursquare check-ins to Fitbit data to health clinic efficiency metrics, all of that sort of dumped into the WordPress database alongside your posts and your media. And so we get into data modeling, describing objects of data that we can store. And we talk about the relationships between them. We start building custom post types. Maybe someone at our local WordPress meetup initially shows us how to do it. And soon we're making our own WordPress plugins so that other people can take advantage of the work that we've done to put this data into our sites. Those same friends from the meetup maybe bully us into speaking at a conference and sharing what we've learned. Always a strong word, but <laughs> um, we find ourselves giving this knowledge back and sharing it with our friends and posting about it online. And then, because we want to continue to evolve, we start looking at the other libraries that WordPress uses internally and thinking about how we can display these more complicated types of data on our sites in an interesting way. And we get into the world of front-end JavaScript frameworks, tools like Backbone, which we find because WordPress uses it, so it must be good. And on a global level, when we're at this point, we're realizing that we're developing these niche skills, so we find ourselves more and more teaching with and working with the communities that we're in to share the knowledge that we've gained and when we start freelancing. People tell us that the resources that we've created are helpful to them, so we build more. We get involved in sort of next generation projects and start to understand how the WordPress software evolves and meet the people that are involved with it. And start to think about the deficiencies in the system and whether there's areas where it's hard to get data from one place to another. And we start getting more and more involved in those projects and those teams up to the point where when WordPress 4.7 is released and all data that we might want to show is now available through a REST API that we've been working on for several years, somewhere along the way we realized that we learned to code by building WordPress sites. It happened for me step by step by coming to meetups like this. My first WordCamp was 11 years ago, WordCamp Boston 2011, and that was the first time that I spoke. And it was because someone from this meetup here in Boston had told me that I should. And along the way, I've had the benefit to learn from a lot of different developers and engineers and designers at a variety of organizations working with a variety of tools. But I can trace the path of my growth as a programmer through these tiny steps within the WordPress ecosystem. And I know that I'm not alone in this. I also know of no other products quite like WordPress that would allow that gradual, accidental, stumbling, and encouraged learning. And all those other things you hear about, all these other tools, we check them out. 
we sort of start digging into what they might be and how they work and how they might play with WordPress. Because WordPress is just code all the way down, and so it can be made to talk to almost any type of system. All of the complexities of software developments are self-inflicted. They're all things we've done to ourselves in the name of solving other problems. But that means that there's a point before and a point after all of these tools were created. And each one of them represents an interesting set of problems and solutions to it. We learn, we grow, we find the tools that work for us, and we share them with others. We help each other make these tools better. And as we learn these things, we do find ourselves coming back to this community and sharing that we found this really cool thing over here that you might want to go take a look at, or have you tried this other content management system? They solve this issue of hosting in a very interesting way, or and it was easy to get my Squarespace site working. Why can't WordPress be that easy to work with? We start to pull in these ideas and mesh them together. I care about WordPress because I care about the learning path that it represents and the global breadth of expression that is enabled by having something out there that is free or very affordable and easy to use, where people actually own their own data and are not beholden to storing it in some system that could go away the next day. I also really admire the way that it's created an economy. I got my start by WordPress freelancing, as I alluded earlier, and there's a lot of people in this room who make their living through this. Bit by bit, one step at a time, whether we're trying to publish our poetry or writing, or whether we're trying to make a go of it as a developer, there's paths that we can take through this environment, because WordPress is for learners. Whether we're developers or business owners or designers, there's something for all of us, and there's ways that we can come together in events like this and share that knowledge and cross-pollinate and get ourselves talking. And this talk, therefore, really isn't about code. It's not even really about software. It's about the community that we've built around WordPress and the fact that the thing that I really want to see us continue to do is to keep that community open and to keep building these pathways and making it easier for ourselves to learn from each other and to grow. Because WordPress is a tool for humans. So how did WordPress become this type of learning community? Because it doesn't start out that way. You don't just say one day, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a clone of this existing blogging software with the goal of building a worldwide community of people from all walks of life who will get together on Sundays and talk about things. Or if you do, there's probably better ways to do that. But um, I think that the things that we do that build a learning community are worth recognizing and reiterating and ensuring that we maintain things like celebrating diversity and keeping our rooms and our communities open and diverse. Because WordPress is used all over the world by people of all walks of life, and we have to continually strive to make our tools and communities as welcoming and open to those people as possible so that we can continue getting new people interested and involved and learning from them and sharing what we know with them. This also means that in tandem, we have to always, um, <coughs> always strive to prioritize accessibility so that people are able to take advantage of these tools regardless of who they are or what sort of abilities they have. But these are kind of passive things. More active things we can do is to be kind. It's one thing to leave the door open, it's another to welcome someone when they come through it. And maintaining diversity is really hard. There's a lot of hate and arrogance out there. So the whole system only works if people feel comfortable sort of coming together and entering this group, and if we are good to each other while we're in the room together. There was a really interesting talk at LoopConf a while ago about the degree of hate, racism, sexism, ableism, that occurs in the WordPress forums and the amount of effort that it takes for the people who moderate those forums and keep our communities safe have to go through and the vitriol that they have to experience in order to make it a comfortable place for everyone else. So kindness is important and it's a constant thing that we have to be paying attention to. I said everything I wanted to say about that. That's like every slide up to this point has just been learned here. <laughs> Um, with this group effort, I think that WordPress as a whole can learn a lot from other tools that are out there to help spread knowledge. And programming knowledge in particular is a rarefied skill, and so I've been really inspired by 
the work that other people are doing, sort of in the vein of what we've been trying to do with the customizer, making it easy to customize and tweak. There are systems out there that are really designed to, um, I'm actually off to um, There are systems out there that are designed to let you easily remix and customize code, and in doing so, learn what it is that makes one program different from another. And I think that these are things that we can take and run with and start building into our own systems to learn from things like Glitch, which is a product that my friend Jim Shipper works on at Fog Creek, um, and think about how we can look at our themes as more of a sort of customization platform so that we can empower people, regardless of technical ability, to mix and match to build the sort of site that they want and do that more at the WordPress level rather than a page builder plugin or some sort of more edge case leaf node. Because encouraging exploration is really critical. That's how we're going to maintain our advantage over things like Squarespace and Wix, is by saying some people use WordPress for e-commerce, some people use it for writing, some people use it to build personal databases and personal online art galleries. And all of these people have customized it in different ways. So sure, let's build new features, but let's make sure that we're not stamping on the work that we've done in the past to get it working the way we like. You don't want to take away what someone has built. You want to be able to show them that there might be something else that they can take advantage of in addition to or instead. And I think that this is all extra important given the changes that are coming to WordPress. Um, because as we build new features like this Gutenberg editor that you might have heard about, the idea is that it's a new writing interface. It's a new way for you to more flexibly govern the content that is in a post. And it's designed to be an improved experience over what we've had on that post-edit screen for the past decade. But it's new and it's different. And it's designed in a way that is much more complex than the tools we have now, which is not a bad thing. As I said, complexity usually comes about from trying to solve a problem, and we're trying to solve some specific problems. But we are putting more and more complex technology in WordPress <coughs> than we could. And as we do this, the things that I want to leave this room with are an idea that we also need to maintain those learning pathways and those paths into the system so that people who are approaching WordPress in two years' time, where these sorts of new interfaces are the de facto standard, still feel like there is a way for them to start digging under the hood and moving things around in a non-destructive way so that they can continue to use this as a tool for their own learning. We need to keep WordPress approachable and encourage curiosity a bit so that we don't have to shut people out. Um, this isn't about making everybody learn to code, as I've said, but none of it is impossible. I have a lot left to learn as a programmer. I think we all do. Um, I'm at an interesting point in my career where for the past eight years I've been realizing that most of what I've been doing is chasing domain-specific knowledge in my field, which is front-end application design, building highly complex interactive apps in the browser. And I'm now at the point where I realize that as I've been doing that, there's a lot that I would like to learn and grow and get better at in databases and back-end languages and API design and interpersonal communication and management. These are all interrelated skills. And um, finding ways that we can sort of avoid shutting ourselves out of things too early and saying, like, these are not just abstract symbols, these are interesting tools to solve interesting problems. And if I encounter that problem, now I will have some understanding of what the tool is for. That's how we kind of navigate this choice paralysis of where we go and what we learn and what we want to work on. We find the problem that's interesting to us and we figure out what it is that we want to achieve and we find a way to make the tools fit for us. Because if we're all kind to each other and we keep finding ways to make it easier for each other to learn and if we encourage curiosity in ourselves and others, then we continue to get new people into this room and WordPress as a community doesn't just peter out as people get sucked into other systems or burned out or tired. There's always going to be new people and the people that are guiding the development of WordPress right now look very different from the people that were doing so 10, 13 years ago. 
And um, I think that it's going to be really interesting if we continue to grow and expand what WordPress is going to look like in another 10 years and what the sorts of people that have made the decisions along the way come to look like themselves because there's going to be a lot more change. There's going to be a lot more people that bring in new ideas. And there's people that don't know how to code at all now who are going to be making like absolute top level calls about the future of this platform and the future of the web as a whole in the next couple of years. And I think that's unique, and I think that's interesting. WordPress is weird. We are an unusual community, but I think that if we keep coming into these rooms, if we keep finding ways to encourage each other and celebrate the differences between us, then somewhere, maybe along the line, we'll get to this point where software begins to feel like something approachable. It begins to feel like something that we can understand and know how it fits into the rest of our life and the way that it governs the systems around us. And if we do that, maybe we will democratize it. Thank you. I got a 10 minute warning just a second ago, so I think we have a little bit of time for questions if anyone has any. Now for you, and you can move on to the next session. I'm not going to be able to hear you in the back. I don't know if you're able to come up to the mic, but um, that's probably easiest. Otherwise, if someone can run that mic back. Thank you. Sorry about that. Hello. Hello. Question about Gutenberg. Um, when that comes out, are, they, are we going to be able to have a chance to test it on like local hosts or staging before we upgrade to it? Absolutely. Good question. Um, the question, if that mic wasn't on the recording, was about Gutenberg, <laughs> and it's about whether we're going to have a chance to test that out locally. And the answer is yes. It's actually a plugin. It's been released as a plugin, so it's something that you can install and activate now and start working with even today. And so the hope is that more and more people will start testing it out, involving themselves in it, and that we can share it with writers and authors and business owners that we know and get feedback on how it works for them and what the pain points are and build it so that it's better and better and that when it does eventually end up in WordPress, I think somewhere around version 5.0, that it will be as battle hardened as possible. So, good question. And yes, please, if you're a developer, check it out. Any other questions? Well, I'll just build on that as a newbie. What is the problem that Gutenberg is designed to solve? So Gutenberg provides what's called a block-based editing interface so that it's easier within one post to arrange different bits of text and then an image and then a video and then text. So rather than just having one block in TinyMCE, which is the editor that we use inside WordPress, it gives us this slightly more guided tool where we can add a block for a video and it gives us specific tools relating to picking a video. And so the idea is that by making it more granular and module, modular, we're going to be able to build interfaces that make it easier to add in a particular type of content. I think that one of the blocks that was recently added is a white space aware text editor for poets, where indentation and spacing matter a lot more than they do when running prose. So it's that type of thing where you can choose the particular type of presentation that you're interested in and having the rest of the system conform to it rather than building one system that has to suit all masters. So that's the idea that Gutenberg is trying to solve. Um, in terms of... I'll repeat the question. I think I can hear you. <laughs> in terms of um, allowing people to onboard, in terms of encouraging contribution and getting started, are there other communities within WordPress to work from who are doing well? The question is about encouraging contribution and encouraging onboarding and people to get involved in the community. Are there other places that we should be looking for inspiration? And um, I think absolutely. Um, this is a little bit left field, but I think that we could learn a lot from sort of grassroots community organizing where people are trying to get people involved in the immediate area around them. 
um, because the way that I see it, software is sort of pervasive and omnipresent, and it's only one step removed from trying to get someone involved in their local community and making things better at a local physical level to imagining the digital overlay on top of that and how these same skills might be able to help with those problems. And then someone has a concrete thing that they can help solve, and they begin to start to have a reason to be interested in technology. Specifically from a technical standpoint, I think that um, wh whatever complaint you might have about the way that modern software development stacks are more and more controlled by specific companies like Facebook and Google, those resources do allow them to build really good developer resources. And I think that we've always struggled in WordPress with their documentation and with where people go for information. It's distributed across the forums and Stack Exchange and the Codex and the new developer handbook. And I think that the more effort we put into building robust and complementary documentation systems, the better it will be at being able to point people in a specific direction when they have a question. Because um, usually questions need a little bit of qualification before somebody is able to start to really involve themselves in the project in a way that's fulfilling to them. And if it's not fulfilling to them, they don't do it. You yeah, have called on time, so that's it. Thank you very much. And have an excellent day to your work now.